family or even something we do at a church like this, but rather faith becomes a part of life, a part of absolutely everything that we do. And I don't know about you, but, but maybe as I was talking with the kids um, about some of our neighbors, uh, your mind started to go to perhaps some of the neighbors that you have or maybe some of the stories you have heard about other people's neighbors. Um, with our neighbor putting in a pool next to us, I've had an opportunity to kind of talk to different people about some of the challenges of when they go to install pools in their backyard. And some of the, let's just call it what it is, some of the craziness that is out there, right? I mean, I've heard stories of, of people putting up um, security cameras around their property to guard and to watch what their neighbors are doing um, to make sure all that is happening. Uh, we hear different things that are happening, but the best one, I think, was one particular lady gave permission to her neighbor to bring the bobcat onto her yard and then into their neighbor's backyard in order to do some work on a necessary pool. Well, the next day, uh, the lady clearly changed her mind, and in order to prove her point that the bobcat was not welcome on her property as access, she lay down right in front of the thing and refused to get up. Now, that is interesting. That is crazy. My, my hope is two things, that you don't have neighbors like that, um, but my bigger hope is please, to dear God, don't be that neighbor. Right, let's not be those types of people. So we wanna ask a question of, what does it start to look like to be a good neighbor? Not only for us individually, but us as a church, as a congregation as well. Because there may be people here this morning that you've been away from church for a long time. That you have not come to church or you have not been interested in Christianity because you have come across kind of the bad neighbor church. Where it seems as if churches are known more for what they are against as opposed to what it is that we are for. That, that, that we come across in, in, in such a negative way about, about speaking up against all the things that we're not for as opposed to presenting the gospel. As we're reminded in John 3, 16, it says, for God, the first word being for, God is for people. And it's out of his love that he sent us Jesus. And so this morning, I want to just unpack a little bit about what does it begin to look like to be a good neighbor? Not only for us as individuals, but us as a congregation, because we don't need some of you, we need all of you. If we were going to continue to build God's kingdom in this community in which we live. And so we're going to turn to a passage in the Bible. And if, you ha if you're not as familiar with the Bible, sometimes you may think, you know, is the Bible still relevant to us? You know, what, what can it teach us? But we're going to turn to a passage that I think go down in history as perhaps some of the most difficult neighbors to deal with. If you have a Bible and you want to open it up, it's Jeremiah chapter 29. It's in the Old Testament. And oftentimes prophets had two primary tasks. The first one is oftentimes prophets would be used by God to tell God's people about what was about to come. The idea of prophecy. This is, this is going to be happening in the future. But the primary function of prophets in the Bible often was not simply to speak about what was about to happen, but rather to get God's people back on track. That, that, that they have swung the wrong way, that they're failing to follow in the ways of God. And so God sends a person, a very courageous person, to stand up in their midst and say, listen, listen, this is what God is asking for you to do. And so Jonathan's going to come up and read a passage from Jeremiah 29, and then we're going to talk a little bit about it, because I believe these truths are timeless. That although the culture has changed, although the times have changed, the principle still remains. And what God was speaking through Jeremiah to Israel thousands of years ago, he's speaking the same truth into us as well. And so let's take a listen and unpack it. So our reading is from Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 to 14. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. 
This was after King Joachim and the Queen Mother, the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elasa, son of Shaphan, and to Jemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When seventy years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Now, if we come at this passage as being kind of generic and understanding kind of, you know, what is it teaching, we may miss the reality of all that is going on. Because the context in which Jeremiah is speaking these words is at a time of an incredibly low point for the nation of Israel, for, for God's people. That they have been conquered by the Babylonians. They are the military strength of the day. And they have seen their city completely lie in ruin, the city of Jerusalem. They have seen their, their homes be torn to the ground. They have seen loved ones likely be put to death. And then as a final move, what the Babylonians were so well known for is that they would not only want to conquer you, they would want to assimilate you. And so they would want to turn you to become like they were. And so what they would do is they would gather up all of the professionals, all of the educated, all of the significant people in your society, and they would carry you off in exile. They would remove you from your homes and plant you in Babylon and want to essentially convert you. So just, just pause there for a moment and think of imagine a nation came into Canada landed in Paris or St. George or Air, wherever you're from, knocked down your houses, knocked down this church, removed you from your home forcibly, and dropped you in their country, and now we're going to try to completely erase everything about your Canadian heritage. That's what was going on here. And so the people were obviously kicking and screaming. They, they were making more of a fuss than like a toddler when you try to put them in a car seat beyond their will, right? The hands are out, the legs are locked, they're, they're not happy. Israel's wanting nothing to do with it. And more so, the leaders and the prophets among them, living there, were saying, listen, 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 this is not good, we understand that. Things are not going well, but in two years, in like two years, God is going to deliver us. Everything is going to be fine. And so there was a mentality amongst Israel of we're not moving into this new city. We're going to hang out here on the outskirts of town. We are going to hunker down. We are going to make the most out of a bad situation. And we are just going to cluster together and do our thing. And then Jeremiah shows up. God actually sees what his people are doing and is like, no, that's not what I've called you to do. 
Now, the last couple of verses of this passage may be familiar to you. Those, those verses where God says, and I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and plans to give you hope and a future. These are the verses that are tacked on to the actual practical application of what God's plan for them was. And this is the message that God gives to his people through Jeremiah. Essentially, it's not going to be two years. It's going to be 70 years years. Your life in this city is going to be generational. You are going to live here. Your kids are going to grow up here. Likely your grandkids are going to live here as well. And this is what I want you to do. I don't want you to resist. I don't want you to hunker down. I want you to settle in. I want you to invest. I want you to build homes. I want you to plant gardens. I want you to get married. I want you to have children. And then it really gets good. Then he goes, and, and, and by the way, I want you to seek the peace and the prosperity of this city. Uh, the, the Hebrew word for that is, is shalom. Perhaps you've heard of that word before. We offer people shalom. It's shalom is a sense of all-encompassing peace from God not only physically, but, but spiritually, mentally as well. Basically, God is saying, I want you to seek the well-being of this entire city. And then on top of that, I want you to pray for them as well. This is not a generic passage. Can you imagine if you're the people of God listening to these words? I mean, as a bit of an aside, no wonder Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. No wonder he was not well liked. If you're bringing messages like this, it's like, God, come on. Do you know who our neighbors are? Do you know who these people are around us? You want us to pray for them? You want us to settle in? You want us to actually seek the good and the well-being of these folks? Really? We start to see parallels to this in the New Testament. When Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, early on in his ministry, gathered around folks around him as well, at another time when God's people, the nation of Israel, was again occupied, this time not by the Babylonians, but by the Romans. And what does Jesus say? He says, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to pray for those who persecute you. I want you to be invested in this community that we are a part of. And so the question is how do we respond? Because you may be sitting there and thinking, you know what, I don't really have difficult neighbors. I'm kind of doing all right. Or, or maybe you do think I do have kind of difficult neighbors, but in comparison to what Israel was dealing with in this passage, I think we all got it off pretty darn good. Uh, for, for the most part, in terms of my conversations, most of us live in Paris or in these towns because we have made the decision to move here. We have wanted to live here. Or, 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 or maybe you haven't made that choice, but I think the application is this. Do you ever consider where you live? In the town, in the community, on the street, in the house, as being an opportunity to be used by God. That it's not just about building a home and building a life, but it's becoming actively engaged in building the kingdom of God, of seeing how God can use you in the midst of your community. Because the reality is that if God could use the Israelites in Babylon, I'm most certain that he can use all of us. But this is the choice we're given. The choice this morning is we can either look at this passage and think, okay, that's kind of interesting historically. Um, you know, thanks for the time. Let's move on. Or we can start to dig in a little bit deeper and to ask the question, what does it start to practically look like for you and for me to be good neighbors? Individually and as a church. A couple thoughts. The first one is this. I think it's important for us to stop the lament that we often make as Christians. And what I mean by that is this, is that we may be living in a culture where we're comfortable, but we sort of lament the fact, particularly as we look back to how it was 
years ago, where it seemed to have Christianity seemed to have, have more of a voice in our culture. We, we can look at some practical things. We can see how, you know, we're no longer have the Lord's Prayer in schools, or you used to no longer be able to shop on Sundays, or there used to never be any, any sports or activities taking place on Sunday, and just, and just more and more people would be coming to church or, or doing something similar to this. And so often we can get caught up with our culture and we can be lamenting the things that are not going right, the things that are going wrong. I'm pretty sure that Israel was lamenting at times. They were disappointed and they were upset. They were not living where they wanted to live. And what did God say to them? Get involved. Move beyond the lament and look for the opportunity to serve. And I think what this passage so often teaches me is that as we look at our congregation, as we look at our voice in our community, that in order for us to engage, in order for us to make a difference, we need to stop the lament. We need to stop worrying about how it was, about complaining about the things that are going on, and look for the opportunities to step in. Look for the opportunities to begin to serve. The second thing I learned from this passage is that there's an interesting dynamic that is going on. Do you notice how these are God's people brought from Jerusalem and dropped into a new culture? And so they are to have an influence on the culture in which they live, but that they are not to be overly influenced. You know, God's desire for them was not that they would abandon God and that they would become Babylonians, but rather they would be a light in the midst of the community. And I believe the very same thing is true for us, that, that, that we live with this, with this challenge in the midst of life, that what does it start to look like to be a follower of Jesus, yet live in a culture that, if we're honest about it, doesn't necessarily agree with our core values, doesn't necessarily hold to the same truths that we hold on to. So what do we do? Some can kind of distance themselves from culture. We can kind of huddle together in these, in these Christian huddles and just say, okay, we're just going to hang out with ourselves and, and hang out with other like-minded people, and then everything's going to be okay. We're going to be safe, right? That may be true, but the kingdom of God is not being advanced. And so as God spoke to these people and says, listen, I want you to get involved in your community, what does that start to look like for us? There's a great New Testament example, and that is the word of an ambassador where we are called, we are ambassadors for, for Christ. Now, if you understand that word ambassador, you know that you are a person from another country that has allegiance to the country you're from living in a foreign land. Uh, Rebecca and I had a bit of a glimpse of this when we lived in Malawi for four years, right? We showed up and lived in Malawi, and it was obvious that we were not Malawian, right? Kind of obvious for a variety of reasons. But but what we didn't do was just simply say, well, we're Canadian, you know, we're just gonna hang out in what they call Canada House, and we're just gonna stay here, and we're just gonna invite Canadians over, and we're only gonna hang out with Canadians, and we're not gonna integrate into Malawi. The Malawians would be like, this Canadian dude is kinda weird, right? He doesn't want any part of Malawian culture. And so we got involved, we got invested, we, we, we started to become a part of the people around us. But during that entire time, people knew that we were Canadian. Uh, so much so, there's this one story I often tell where we lived in Blantyre, a city of about a million people. And there was a bus stop about a kilometer and a half away from where we lived. And there was a volunteer who was coming from the north 12 hours, and he landed at the bus depot in Blantyre. And he didn't know my name, um, but he knew that if he showed up, he would get a place to eat and one of Rebecca's amazing meals. And so... He thought, all right, here we go. And so you know what he said? He showed up at the bus depot, and people were like, oh, were you looking for a hotel? Are you looking for somewhere to go? He goes, no, I'm, to I'm looking for the tall, white Canadian guy. <laughs> Somebody walked him from the depot to our front door and knocked on the gate. Right? People knew that we were Canadian. And so it wasn't just enough for us to be living in Malawi. We knew that we were representing Canada. And that for most of the Malawians, they had never been to Canada. They had never met another Canadian. And so guess what? <laughs> Bad news for all of you. We are their only picture of Canada. 
right? And so they would start to see us and understand us and think, well, this is what Canadians must be like. When the New Testament talks about how we are ambassadors for Christ, this is the very image that we have before us. The reality that we are living in this community, in these cultures, but have you ever thought that we are representatives of Christ? Do you believe that, that, that other people's opinions of the church or of Christianity or of Jesus has a lot to do with how we live and how we behave? You start to realize that being a follower of Jesus is not just about what you believe, but has critical importance in terms of how it is we behave. Because people are watching, and oftentimes before we can invite, before we can invite someone to consider Jesus, before we can invite someone to consider coming to church, they want to see, have you invested? Have you invested in me? Have you invested in this community? Which is why I think some of the best news I saw this morning was the fact that so many people stood up when they said, I know my neighbors, I know their names, they've been into my house, I've been into their house, because that is the first step of investing in people, of beginning to live life with people, to begin to see the reality and the opportunities that we have in terms of our sphere of influence. On the street that you live in, in the neighborhood, that we have an opportunity to reflect the reality of Jesus in the midst of all of life. Because that's what God called his people to do. If, if you start to look at the history of the Bible, you see what God does over and over and over again, is he builds these communities of people who he says, be devoted to me and be willing to love your neighbors. And then out of these communities, we begin to see an impact and an influence as well. I believe the very same thing is true for us in Paris. And that's why we continue to want to go down the path that as a congregation, we want to be a church that is known by what we are for. That, that we are known to be loving people, to showing kindness to people, to living out our faith in practical ways so that we can get to a place where even if people may disagree with certain truths that we hold on to, they can say, although I may not agree with that, I cannot deny their love for this town, this, this opportunity that we have been given. And so three ways, three suggestions I want to pull out as practically how we can take this into our lives. The first one is to be an ambassador means we're going to be intentional. You've probably heard the, the comment, you know, a random act of kindness, right? Great idea. Let's just shorten that phrase down. Let's lose the word random. Let's be people of acts of kindness, right? Because a random act of kindness is like, oh, yeah, this just, this just happened. I just happened to be kind today. No, what if we chose to intentionally invest in our community in such a way that we were ambassadors, so that not only when you're at church, but when you're in the grocery store, when you're coaching soccer, when you're teaching children how to read in school, when you're hanging out in the park, when you're going to get ice cream at Twisted Treats, whatever it may be, what if we saw that as an opportunity to truly live out our faith? So that faith didn't simply become a thing where we go to church, we read our Bible, and we pray. It's so much more than that. God wants something for us, but he also wants something from us. And so how can we be more intentional? Second thing I would touch on from this passage, we, we mentioned it last week, so I won't dwell here for long, but that is to pray for our communities. Right in this passage, God says, pray for the city with which you live. And I find more often in my life, prayer becomes more meaningful and has a greater impact when it becomes less generic. So let's not just pray, God bless Paris. Pray for your neighbors by name. Pray for the businesses by name. Pray for the schools by name. Pray for our, our town council by name. Pray specifically for people in our town. 
Because it's not just simply about us being good people, it's about them being open to the movement of God. And so be intentional about how we pray. And then the third one is be people of action. Notice Jeremiah, God through Jeremiah says, seek the peace and the prosperity. Be intentional. Start to look for ways to serve others. We, we mentioned here already, cut grass, shovel the driveway, help pick weeds, whatever it may be, little things. Sometimes it'll be unintentional opportunities as a means of serving your neighbor. Our neighbor's putting in a pool, I mentioned that earlier, and two Sundays ago we came home and disasters of all disasters in the Sherbino household. Our kids got home and picked up their devices and God forbid there was no internet. Right, I thought the sky was falling, right? Like, what was gonna happen next? Dad, dad, we don't have any internet. Dad, dad, we don't have any internet. To be honest, I was freaking out a little bit inside too. I was like, what's going on? And so, so I walked out and I walk out around our property and I noticed that there, the dig has gone into our yard a little bit and I look down and I pick up and here's one line of my internet and here's the other line of my internet. And listen, I'm no technician, but I'm like, I think I've identified the problem. I think, as I'm standing there holding these two wires, my, my neighbor is coming out of the back thing. More likely his wife is shoving him out to get out there and sort this problem, right? And he's like, Joel, like, ah oh, man, like really, really sorry. Now I have an option there, right? I could throw down the wires, get all annoyed, and be like, I let your bobcat come in and this is what happens. But, but it struck me in that moment is how I react to this is going to lay a foundation for anything else that our relationship will have happen in the future. And so I was like, you know what, don't worry about it. We'll get it sorted. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll get it done. In miracles of miracles, cable guy showed up the next day and all was sorted. You see, there's little opportunities that if we're more kingdom-minded as ambassadors, we'll respond positively to. One last story, and we'll end on this, is at the back of our church, there's a piece of grass, and we share it with our, our neighbors. And we have amazing volunteers who do so much in this church, and one of them is taking care of the beauty of the grounds. That's, that's done all by volunteers, and so thank you for that. But there's one, there's one person who cuts the grass, and, and he could do just the strip of grass on our property, right? He could do that. But he chose to go to the neighbor and say, hey, listen, I need to cut this grass. Do you mind if I just cut your grass as well? Like, as a church, what a great opportunity. And so he cuts their grass every time he cuts our grass. And that's an opportunity to be reaching out to our neighbors. And so a practical takeaway I hope, well, I might offend some, but if you live with two, between two houses and you have that section of grass running up and down your two houses, just cut the whole stinking section for the love, right? Like, here's a little opportunity for us, but look for these opportunities day by day by day because when we do, we're creating opportunities. Maybe not in that moment, but we are creating opportunities to invite. Why? because we have invested in their lives. And so three things to do this week. First one is pray. Be praying for someone in your community by name this week. Second thing, look for opportunities to serve. What is something that, that you can do just as, as a kind gesture? Maybe have someone into your home. Maybe just strike up, whatever it may be. You guys are creative people. And the third one is join us on June 24th. After the service, we're gonna have a bit of a brainstorming session, maybe a time of sharing of ways that we as a congregation can be more engaged in our community. Because outreach community involvement it is not just about the pastor. It's not just about a committee. It's about all of us. We don't need some of you. We need all of you. And so join us after the service and share the ideas of what we can be doing to engage our community in intentional and creative ways. Because wherever you live, 
God's hope for you is not that you will just build a home and that you will build a life, but that you will begin building his kingdom. Let's pray. And so, Lord Jesus, we are grateful for the way that you have loved us. And as I think of uh, this reality of moving into the neighborhood,